And now it's time for the Everlasting Gospel. Welcome to the Everlasting Gospel today. I'm Gary McDade, the host of the program. And we're so glad you've joined us for our study today. You know, today we're going to be studying about the burial of Christ. We understand from the teaching of the New Testament that there are three elements, fundamental, foundational elements to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they are the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, many years ago, a friend of mine and a fellow who was a great preacher and Wendell Winkler made the statement, we need to be preaching about the burial of Christ. We don't preach about the burial of Christ enough. And you know how it happens when you're sitting listening to a sermon, you feel guilty because you know he's just telling the exact truth. And I thought, I don't think I've ever presented a lesson on the burial of Christ. But he was urging us to see how important the burial of Christ is. It's one of the three foundational pillars to the gospel, the gospel that saves our souls from eternal ruin and points us in the direction of heaven. So today we're going to be taking a look at the burial of Christ. We recently studied about the crucifixion of Christ and devoted a lesson to that. And in a subsequent lesson, we'll bring a lesson on the resurrection of Christ. So we'll have these three great truths in front of us. Today, let's look at a passage of Scripture. Our text for the lesson is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And for those who are viewing by way of TV, we'll put that on the screen for your edification. In this passage of Scripture, we see how important the gospel is and how important these three elements of the gospel truly and really are. In the 1 Corinthians 15, we start at verse 1. Oh, wait on me just a minute. Let me get back to this verse, 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 1. Okay, here we go. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. It stands out to me that he says we're saved by this gospel. In Romans 1 and 16, Paul affirmed, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, that is, to Jew and Gentile. So we have here the power of God, in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it contains the teaching about the burial of Christ. If we wanted to take the time to read about the crucifixion of Christ, and had we the time, we would discuss all three in one lesson, but we don't have the time. But if we did, we'd go to Matthew chapter 27 and start at verse 15 and read down through verse 26. If we did, we would go to Matthew chapter 27 and look at verses 15 to 26. And there you would have a glimpse of the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, we're going to be emphasizing the burial of Christ. You know, to do that, I'd like for us to go to another thought here, and that is that the Old Testament prophecy in Isaiah 53 has many details that Christ fulfilled exactly. One of these has to do with his burial. And so that's why we want to study about the burial of Jesus Christ it is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy that he was buried. You know, you can read in the Old Testament books sometimes, like, for example, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 16, verses 4 to 6. And there you'll find that if there were people who were not buried, it was shameful. In fact, it's also the case in Jeremiah twenty-five thirty-three that upon God's enemies, he makes the statement to show the absolute shame of their rebellion and rejection of him while they lived, and that continuing in their death because they would not even have the privilege, the dignity of being buried. So a burial is a dignified thing, and without it, it's shameful. We're emphasizing the burial of Jesus Christ. So the Messianic prophecy of Isaiah, you know, he is the Messianic prophet. In chapter 53 of his book, he tells about Christ being with the rich in his death. Let's read this. It's Isaiah chapter 53, and we'll read just verse 9 in the interest of time. Isaiah 53, 9. He was taken from prison and from judgment, 
and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. You know, this tells us something about the nature of these predictive prophecies of Christ. This is made in the 8th century B.C., 740 years before Christ is even born. These are not self-fulfilling prophecies. Sometimes people will be skeptical about the Bible and say, well, yeah, these things were written long ago, and then Jesus came along and knew what was said about him, and then he would fulfill that. Well, that is true in a lot of places, a lot of instances. Jesus said, I'm come to fulfill the law in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. But there are some things associated with his birth and with his life and his death that he could not self-fulfill, and the burial of Christ is one of them. I'll tell you, once you're dead, you're dependent upon others as to where you will be buried, if you'll be buried. And Jesus Christ was no different in that regard. Others buried him. Now then, in order for him to be the Messiah, he must be buried with the rich in his death. And that's what we read about then in the fulfillment of it over here in Matthew's gospel. Let's look at Matthew chapter 27. And I'd like to read, if if you have the time with me, I'd like to read from verse 57 down through verse 60. These are tender times in the New Testament narrative because they tell about what happened after the Son of God suffered, bled, and died on Calvary's cross. Still echoing would be the words that he uttered, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And his words, It is finished, John 19 and verse 30. In the very echo of those words from Mount Calvary, we find then that our Lord, when he had cried with a loud voice, gave up the ghost, saying, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then he was deceased on that cross. A Roman soldier came by and verified that he was dead by thrusting a spear into his side. Forthwith came there out blood and water, a clear indication that the victim was deceased. Now here's what happens, and we'll start, as I said, in verse 57. We'll see what happens after his death, and we'll look at his burial and the details of that. Let's look at Matthew 27. We'll start at verse 57. And when even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate, and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. Joseph of Arimathea took the body of Jesus Christ, his nail-pierced hands and feet, took it down from the cross, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb. It's interesting to us as we read about Joseph of Arimathea that in verse 57, Matthew the Apostle tells us a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph. That fulfilled that prophecy we read in Isaiah chapter 59 or 53 at verse 9. Now let's look for a moment, if you've got the time with me, to the parallel text of this in John's gospel. And for that, we go to John chapter 19, verses 38 to 42. John 19. We're going to see a little bit added to the narrative of Matthew here, and we'll be interested to see what that is. John 19, verse 38. Again, Joseph is going to take the body of Christ down from the cross. In John chapter 19... Bear with me as I get to that passage. I was over in Acts. Here in John 19, verse 38. This is where we read. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, 
which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in the linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new sepulcher wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they, Jesus therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. So now we find that Joseph of Arimathea had an assistant, a man by the name of Nicodemus. And you may remember reading in John's Gospel back in chapter 3 about he came to Jesus by night with some very serious questions. And Jesus spoke to him about the new birth and just what was involved in the new birth. And we find that here Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they took the body of Christ down from the cross. And remember, Joseph had a linen cloth, clean linen cloth in which to wrap the body of Jesus. And now Nicodemus came with about 100 pounds of myrrh and aloes, these spices. That was the manner of the Jews, the custom of the Jews to interweave among that garment, that cloth, wrapping the body of Jesus as they took him from the cross. And then they laid him in Joseph's tomb, carved hewn out of a rock. And then you remember Joseph rolled a stone over the door. Now there's more that's said about that stone being rolled over the door as the opponents of Christ will approach Pilate. And you remember a guard will be set and that stone will be sealed with a Roman seal. I don't know exactly how it was. I picture one way it could have been was to take the wax stick the wax on the rock with a cord and stick another item of wax on the opening, the wall of the, the opening, and run that cord between those covering them in wax. Now, the only way you're going to move that rock is by breaking that wax seal. And if you do that, they'll know someone is tampered with that grave. Well, a seal is set and a Roman guard is placed there to guard the body of Christ. And the specific reason for that, Matthew tells us, is to keep the disciples from coming and stealing away the body. I think it's interesting that sometimes today, those who are critics of the Bible and skeptics of our Lord Jesus Christ, and even of his burial, will say that his disciples came and stole away the body. Did you forget about the Roman guards that were set? I don't think you're going to steal anything with guards posted at that door to, to avoid and to prevent that. So that was the circumstance of the death of Christ and the burial of Christ, I think it is nice for us to notice that it was with dignity that Joseph and Nicodemus came and carefully took the body from the cross and laid it in the garden tomb, which was nearby the place of the skull or Golgotha, also known as Calvary. And Jesus was treated with great respect and love by both Joseph and Nicodemus. It certainly warms our heart to know that our Savior's body was respectfully treated at his death. So here you have then the burial of Jesus Christ. One of the things that is important for us to see and understand and to affirm and to prove is that Christ was indeed dead. Because remember the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And of course we've seen already the proof of that when the Roman soldier pierced his side, blood and water came out. But now you see another proof of his death in his burial, you bury people that are deceased, and that is what they did with Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting for me to notice that early on there were those, they were known as docetics. And the reason they're called docetics is that word means, I seem, I think. And they began to relate that which is evil to that which is material. And they really thought they were doing a good turn when they said, Christ could not have had a material body like we have because material is evil. And there's still some today who think modified forms of that. And so they said he only seemed to have a body. If you looked at him, his body would look like anyone else's. But the way they illustrated it was this. If he were to walk down a sandy beach, he would leave no footprint because he didn't really have a body. Now, friends, that's false doctrine. And that false doctrine was countered with the writing and the publication of these gospel accounts that prove that, yes, Jesus had a body and it was take, taken from the cross and placed into the tomb. The wrapping of that body with this linen and those spices included therein 
shows that, yes, he had a body, a physical body. And so he was placed in that garden tomb. It is really necessary for us to see that Christ, yes, indeed, did die. Because in our next study, we're going to be looking at his resurrection. And there are some who want to offer criticism about the resurrection of Christ by saying he didn't really die. He only swooned, they say, using the word swoon. He seemed to have died. And so he was laid in that cool tomb, and then later he physically revived. No, he was dead, as shown by the piercing of his side, as shown by the careful and dignified manner in which his deceased body was laid into that tomb. He was wrapped according to the manner of the Jewish burial, placed into that tomb. It proves that, yes, Christ died. So that's the importance, I think, of seeing and understanding something about the burial of Christ. But next in our study, let's go to another line of reasoning, if we might. And that would be a statement that is made during the personal ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Jews came to Jesus, and we'll find this in Matthew chapter 12, starting with verse 38. And here's another reference to the burial of Christ, Matthew 12, starting with verse 38. Jesus had just got finished saying that you need to be careful what you say because you're going to be judged by what you say. This is Matthew chapter 12. You know, he says, I tell you, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Now, were you listening to Christ at that moment? You might think, you know, what we need to take a look at is how careful we need to be in the usage of our words. But that's not what happens here. Verse 38, watch what happens. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Well, wait a minute. You're, you should have been listening to Christ. He asked you to be thoughtful in what you say and realize that your words have such a weight to them that they will serve as one of the basis of judgment on the day of judgment. What you say, you're going to be held accountable for what you say. And yet they arrogantly, boldly speak up and say, we want to see a sign demanding a sign from Christ. I'm concerned that today I see a little of that in some of the services that are broadcast where people want to say, and I heard a man say this just this past Lord's Day on television, that we're looking for a miracle from God. And if we stand together and say, we are deserving of this miracle, God will provide it. They're in the same place these scribes and Pharisees were in, thinking that because I want to declare my need for a miracle, that place is the God of heaven under obligation to do what I say. Do you not know that God is in heaven and we're upon earth? Therefore, let thy words be few. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 1 and 2. I think our people today, the people around me, the people with whom we are associated in this climate, in this culture, in this society, really, really need, maybe above all else, to sit down and read the Bible. You need to know, especially the preachers, and this preacher that I was hearing, he's from right here in Chattanooga. He's on every Sunday morning. I don't think he's reading his Bible to say something like that, that you're expecting a miracle. God's going to give you that miracle. And when we stand together looking for that miracle, that God's going to provide it. Now, I know what he's promising them is health and prosperity. And that's what they call the health and prosperity gospel. It's particular to our age, and it's not something that's found in the Bible. You know how you know that? Because in the Bible, people were giving everything they had to help feed and tend those who were Christians in Acts chapter 4. And you'll find these same Christians talk about health. Many of them were being slaughtered. Stephen is stoned to death in Acts chapter 7, you'll recall. What happened to the health and wealth gospel for those people? Well, it's not the way it's being presented today. And it is used as an enticement to fill church buildings and people receiving an empty promise. Ladies and gentlemen, if you attend services at a place like that, I would like to encourage you to have more respect for yourself and more respect for the Bible than to be led astray by some charlatan who's, who's proposing to offer to you a miraculous healing, a miraculous gathering of wealth. The Bible doesn't speak in those terms. We're to forsake ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him daily. That's what the Lord instructs us to do. In Luke chapter 14, verse 23. But now, our generation today is not too horribly unlike 
the generation of Jesus' day where these scribes and Pharisees said, Master, we would see a sign from thee. We want to just call forward a miracle because we want to see one. Like this is some kind of a carnival sideshow. When you study the miracles of Christ, you find that on some occasions, like one in particular where he heals the blind people, you'll find that he was moved with compassion on them. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 29. There are reasons Jesus did miracles during his personal ministry also. The reason for miracles done by the apostles is stated by our Lord. You know what goes with the miracles of the first century? They were confirming this word. That was their overall purpose. And the Lord went with them and was working with them, confirming their word with signs following. Amen. Those are the last words of Mark's gospel. So those were the purposes of the miracles done by the apostles to confirm this word. And if you want to see the further scriptural proof of that, I would invite your attention to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. That's what's stated there about the purpose of those miracles. So miracles were never done as a kind of a sideshow or just something to attract attention, but they were done in order to confirm the word of God, in order to confirm the deity of the Son of God, the fact that Jesus is the Christ. Now let's look further at what is said. Jesus answered these people wanting a miracle. He answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seek after a sign. That's why I said I think the first century people were not too much unlike the 21st century people. Evil and adulterous. You know, if you were to say, well, that's a harsh thing to say about a society. Where is your proof of that? I would say cut on the TV for about, oh, 30 seconds. And you'll see it. You already know it. This is an evil and an adulterous generation. We just recently had in our culture an entire month dedicated, devoted to Pride Month. Do you know what that is? Do you know what that is? That's the LGBTQ plus XYZ people saying why this is something we're proud of and we want to be honored for our choice of violating the Word of God in so many places like 1 Corinthians Chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, or Romans chapter 1. We want to be honored for standing in defiance of the Word of God. We have choices that we can make, even concerning our own life and behavior. And we're to exercise our choices in harmony with the teaching of the Word of God. It's to be like a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. Psalm 119 at verse 105. So here we find people really reveling in immorality and adultery and evil in our own society. Something else that's a matter of grave concern is the use of drugs that's on such a high plane, high level of use. Not that used to be something that was rare. Do you know, you know how old I am? I'm old enough to tell you right here that when I went to high school in Memphis, and Kingsbury High School was one of the largest high schools in the state, not the largest at one time, and nobody smoked a marijuana cigarette. Nobody. You never heard of that. It was after we graduated that we heard somebody got caught with marijuana at Kingsbury. Today, (laughs) it'd be hard not to find the use of marijuana. Just used promiscuously throughout our society. We live in an evil generation. The use of alcohol and the proliferation of alcohol. You know, what's this going on with Bud Light? Everybody knows about that scandal with Bud Light. They've been advocating LGBTQ and got in a little trouble And their sales dropped a billion dollars. Well, what's happening here? People are just absorbed in alcohol, drugs, promiscuity, adultery. So when we look back and we read about these people, Jesus saying to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Well, don't be too surprised to wonder what that is because we're in such a society as that ours ours is today. I'm sorry to say. Now, we're on television and radio trying to change that trying to get people into the Bible and let the Bible be our standard and our guide. One of our challenges there is people are wanting a sign. They're wanting to see the miraculous. They're wanting the direct operation of the Holy Spirit to operate immediately and directly on their heart and life without ever having to read or study the Bible. And God doesn't do that. This is the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6 and 17. And if there's any influence exercised upon our hearts and minds today for good, And for righteousness, it's done through the Word of God exclusively. 
Oh, it's true that we have examples from people living around us and encouragement from their words, but it's the words of the Bible that yield faith. Romans 10 at verse 17. So let's go on to see what Jesus had to say here to these scribes and Pharisees. We've really embellished their setting and their culture. Jesus said, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. I wish people would listen to the way Jesus taught. It was not his perspective that just whatever you want, whatever you can think of in your mind that you want, my purpose is to give it to you. That's the way a lot of people look at the church today. And that's foreign to the teaching of the scripture. There have been times when people would call up the church building. Hello, what you need? I need some money. Do you have cash money? We don't hand out cash. Click. And they're evidently going through the, through, through the yellow pages, calling churches, saying, I need money, and waiting for somebody to just give them cash without any idea of why they need the cash or what the problems are in their life or how they could actually help them. And many times, it's not good what they're doing. So here you'll find Jesus didn't do that. People want a sign. You don't just give them a sign because they wanted it. He says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south shall rise in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and his burial, three days and three nights. The Jews considered any part of a day to be a day, and that's why he is crucified on Friday, raised on Sunday, part of Friday, Saturday, part of Sunday, would be three days and three nights, according to Jewish reckoning. And that would be the standard that we go by. The burial of Christ stood in evidence of the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's what the scribes and Pharisees were asking him. Are you able to do a sign for us? They might as well have said to do a sign for us so we'll, we might consider believing you're the Son of God. No, here's the sign you're going to get. The sign of the prophet Jonah. Like he was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, I'm going to be three days and three nights in the earth. The burial of Christ proves that Jesus Christ is the Son of God because it's in harmony with Old Testament prophecy and is a fulfillment of those statements concerning him. Today we've had the opportunity and privilege to be studying about the burial of Christ. I hope that you'll drop back. If you'd like to see these lessons in tandem or in triplicate, I guess I should say, they'll be posted on YouTube under my name, Gary McDade. And there you can look up. I'll make a playlist of them and I'll call it the Gospel you can look up the crucifixion of Christ, this lesson, the burial of Christ, and the next lesson, the resurrection of Christ. I hope you'll return and join us for that important faith-building study next time.